Right. Okay, I was thinking about the fact that my talk was so much less informative than the, the last talk on Mars, so thank you for lowering the bar so significantly by showing videos of masturbating robots. Um, my goal in my research is very, very different than that. And I'm going to talk about how we've used robots to spy on the sex lives of birds. So, you're all familiar with Darwin's theory of natural selection, which is, of course, very powerful in explaining the evolution of all sorts of traits like camouflage, coloration, and fish, and insects, and birds. And it helps us understand how these traits allow animals to stay alive and have lots of offspring and pass on their genes to the next generation. But Darwin's theory of natural selection alone had a very difficult time explaining animals like the peacock, where these elaborate traits and behaviors seem to make the male an easy target for predators. And this was a big deal for Darwin. He was stressed out about this. There's this great letter that he wrote to his friend where he said, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail whenever I gaze at it makes me feel sick. <laughs> and he was kind of a sickly guy, so we can't blame it all on a peacock. But, um, but this, was, this was a big deal for his theory, a big threat to his theory. And so like many things in biology, most things in biology, Darwin himself proposed the solution to this problem, which is his theory of sexual selection. And that can play out in two ways. It can be males or um, whichever sex is competing, battling together for access to mates and resources like we see with elephant seals or elves. Um, but another way that this can play out is by female choice. When females prefer to mate with the most ornamented of males, or whichever sex is choosy and whichever sex is flashy. Usually females are choosy, usually males are flashy. So this plays out when females basically demand that males have elaborate display traits. So in the case of pea pow, pea hens prefer to mate with males that have more eye spots on their trains. Okay? So the question of why males have these elaborate trains, why do peacocks have these beautiful trains, is because pea hens are demanding them. And so pea hens, in a way, females in many of these species act like artists over evolutionary time, shaping these gorgeous, gorgeous creatures into their aesthetic demands, or their aesthetic whims. But why would a female bother to be paying attention to the number of eye spots on the male's train? What did she get from them? So in many of these species, like the peafowl, and the sage grouse, and the bowerbirds that I'll tell you about today, many of the most extraordinary species, males don't provide any parental care. They don't help the females raise the young. Females don't live on the male's territory. The only thing she gets from the male when she mates with him is sperm. So if all she's after sperm, why does she care if the male had lots of eye spots on his train? There's a few hypotheses for these. There's evidence for all of them in some cases. But why pay attention to traits? One possibility is that she's learning about his genes. So she's trying to pick a male that has good genes that are going to make her offspring healthy or sexy or both. And she could be learning about benefits that she may gain, and in the case of the peafowl and the sage grouse and the bowerbirds, that might just mean avoiding males that are covered in parasites or have STDs or something like that. Or she could just be a sucker for this sort of dazzling sexiness, right? So he could be trying to sort of mesmerize her with his shimmering train. Which if you've ever seen a peacock courtship, it kind of it kind of looks like that. And so regardless of which of these things is true, or if all of them are true to some extent, the female is in control of the situation. She's the one that's deciding when mating happens or doesn't happen. But in all of these species, in peafowl as well as lots of other species, courtship isn't just about the male sort of unfurling his train and the female passively observing and checking him out. Courtships are these elaborate and dynamic interactions Lots of different things going on, They're complex affairs. And so for a male to be successful, he doesn't just have to have a lot of eye spots on his train. He also has to be in the right place at the right time. He has to figure out which females to approach, and then he has to approach the female without scaring her away. And then they have to interact appropriately during courtship. And so success in courtship is not just about the flashy traits. It's also about paying attention to the social situation. So Darwin's process of sexual selection may favor not only flashy traits, but also social intelligence. 
And so, in a room full of nerds, of course, the nerds all say, yay, sexual selection favors intelligence, I'm smart, that's great. But then, of course, we remember that we're talking about social intelligence, <laughs> which is social skills, which is not an arena in which nerds are known for their high-functioning abilities, right? So, but we know that in, in these different species, there's strong, strong selection for social intelligence. So maybe, maybe we can learn something from them. And this is certainly ill-advised, but as Nerd and I, we all had some drinks. And so maybe we can ask, is there any dating advice that we can glean from birds to nerds? Right? So we'll keep that in mind as we talk about the different species that we've studied in my lab using robots. OK, so the first species I'm going to tell you about is the species that I studied for my dissertation research, satin bowerbird. These are absolutely fantastic animals. They're in Eastern Australia in the rainforests, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, and so the males build this structure called the bower. It's this two-walled stick structure here, a platform that sticks out in front, which they decorate with lots of different things. They love the color blue. Uh, they also love yellow, contrasting with the blue, any sort of novel objects. We had one bower that had a baby's pacifier on it, which I always imagined that it plucked from the mouth of the screaming baby. Um, and anything that they can use to impress the female. So here's the female. She flies around, visits lots of different males for courtship. The male will do a song and dance for her, and then she'll decide who she wants to mate with. And females prefer males with a symmetrical, well-built bower, lots of decorations, and excellent song and dance. So we know from them that, um, from previous research on these birds, we know that females, sorry, females prefer intense and vigorous male displays. So females like a male that does a very vigorous song and dance for her. But we also know that sometimes these vigorous songs and dance freak the female out. So they scare her, she gets startled, she sometimes flies away. And so the male is walking this fine line where he has to he has to dance intensely to impress her, but if he's too intense too soon, he scares her away. Right? So this is very complex interplay. And I noticed watching courtships that females, when they first arrive, they're very jittery, but after a while they start start crouching down and they get a little more comfortable. And at that point the male can sort of ramp it up she's less likely to be startled. So I wondered, are males paying attention to this? So are successful males sort of paying attention and adjusting their courtship accordingly? So that's what I set out to test. And in order to test that hypothesis, you really want to be able to manipulate the female behavior. You want to be able to get the female to do a particular thing and then measure how males respond and ask, are the most responsive males the most successful? And that's tricky to do with real animals. It's hard to study natural courtships and do this because it turns out that with a really unattractive male, females just never even go visit him. So you can't really study how he does in courtship because he doesn't have the opportunity. And when they do go visit him, they act totally differently than they do when they're being courted by uh, attractive males. So really, you need some way to experimentally control this. So that's where the robots come in. So this was the first robot I built. This is a robot sat in Bowerbird. These are the electronic innards of the robot. And I dressed that up like a satin bowerbird in a state-of-the-art robot fabrication facility in the rainforest shack. And then the finished product looked like this. So this is a female, and I could place her inside of the walls of the bower where courtship would normally happen. I take the remote control, hide in a blind. I can control her behavior and see how the males respond. So this is a little video clip of what this looks like. And this first little clip here is to just show you some of the troubleshooting we had to do to get this to work. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, hopefully, not too much trauma for the beta tester males. <laughs> okay, so this is the finished robot, and she's demonstrating this crouching behavior I was telling you about. When a female is really ready to mate, she fluffs up her wings, and that's how she solicits population from the male. So here's the, here's the male doing his intense display with a yellow leaf in his feet. You can see how it would be startling to a female. And now he's going to mimic a kookaburra and a honey eater. And in case you're not convinced yet,
males, the different rates of female crouching, and different behaviors. And so what did we find? What are the take-home messages from what we found? I'm not showing you any plots. Um, I'm happy to give into the details if anyone's interested. What did we find? We found that the most successful males, these are the males that are the most successful at convincing real females to mate with them, they displayed at the highest intensity, the most vigorous displays, without freaking females out. And they did this by paying attention to female signals during courtship to avoid coming on too strong too soon. So basically they watched the female behavior, we tested this with the robot, and they only ramped up their intensity after the female was crouching. Whereas these unsuccessful guys would just do what they were going to do regardless of what the female was doing. Okay? And they, they displayed way too intensity before she was ready, they startled real females, and they were less successful in courtship with real females. So if we wanted to boil this down and sort of summarize what we found into what might constitute some dating advice from a power bird, it would be something like this. Take it down a notch. You know, the over-eager beaver does not get the worm. And then listen, pay attention to the female. And I do want to emphasize here that I do not actually advocate taking dating advice for birds. I really want to emphasize that um, for a number of reasons. In case there's any congressional aides watching from National Science Foundation, <laughs> or while we're looking for examples of NSF grants used to fund frivolous research, for example. Um, we're already on Senator Coburn's list from last year, so move along. <laughs> it's a badge of honor, anyway. Um, but it, it's always ill if thank you. Excellent, but that's an applause line. Okay, so that's what we found from Bowerbirds. So now let's turn to the greater sage grouse. So this is the species that I study now. These guys are found in North America, a little closer to home. We even have some populations in California, the eastern side of the Sierras. They're absolutely beautiful birds. I study them in Wyoming in a field site um, in land or the east side of the Wind River Range. It's a beautiful part of the Rocky Mountains. It's absolutely spectacular. And we spend about three months out there every spring. I just got back a few weeks ago. We make our own little trailer park in the middle of nowhere. We call it Chicken Camp or Cold Mud Pit, Wyoming, depending on the weather. And we live out there for a few months with field assistants that help us do all of this work. And so we're out there to study the sage grouse. So I don't know if you can see it in this video. It's this time lapse with the moon setting over the Wind River Range in the background. All these little bits bouncing around in the foreground, these are all males strutting. So this is a lek. The males arrive on the lek territory, this area. Every morning during the breeding season, they puff up and strut around, dance for females. Females are cryptic, you can't see them, but they're moving around in and amongst the males, basically comparison shopping for a mate. They're trying to decide who they want to mate with. Once they mate, that's the end of their relationship. Female takes care of the young on her own, and does everything else, the male continues dancing and tries to convince other females to mate with them. And not all males are equally successful. Some males get almost all of the mates. So what does this look like up close? This is a close-up view of sage grouse courtship. The first sound you're going to hear is basically a belch. He's exchanging air from this inflated esophagus. And then the second sound is a swishing of wings over modified feathers on his chest, and then that's followed by a vocal sound. <laughs> we tell them apart by the pattern of plumage on their tails. And you can see they're very fancy. They've got a lot going on. They file plumes on top of their heads, combs over their eyes, amazing displays. And they're totally weird and unbird like in almost every way. So, what does a female sage grouse want? What is she looking for in a mate? And I hope that's not totally cut off. Because this is an important male at the bottom. So when we talk about what a female wants, I'm going to talk about it in the context of one particular male, Sage Grouse, who was very special. He dominated breeding on Cottontail Lek, one of our main study Leks, not this spring, but the previous spring, 2014, and our field crew nicknamed him Dick, which opened up this whole 
arena of innuendo to us, so let's talk about them. So, these are all hens. I don't know if you can see over here, you can certainly see on the side over there. He's surrounded by hens. He absolutely dominated mating. So, last spring, we're still counting all the populations from videos we bring back to UC Davis. I have lots of undergrads counting populations from videos. This is the pornology component to all of this. But as of just this week, we have over 130 different populations last spring. He was out there again this year. He's still going. He doesn't. He didn't dominate quite as extraordinarily. But 130 populations. 37 of those were on one morning. 23 of those were in one 23-minute long period of time. So for once a minute, for 23 minutes, he made it with a different hen. It was truly, truly extraordinary. So what is it about Dick? What makes a sexy sage grouse sexy? And this has been studied for a long time. People have been asking this question for a long time. So what do we know? Show up and work hard is the number one piece of advice from a sage grouse. So Dick here is the first to arrive on the lock at the beginning of the breeding season, first to arrive every morning, last to leave. And when he's there, he is working it. Don't be scabby. So females don't like males that have lots of visible scars from ectoparasites on their vocal sacs. So as far as dating advice goes, avoiding visible scabs from life, it's hard to argue with, right? That's solid, solid common sense advice. Have lots of other hens around. So it turns out that hens pay attention to what other hens are doing. So if you can convince a few females to make with you, then there will be a cascade of populations, especially if those are older hens, because younger hens will pay attention to what the older hens are doing and just copy what they're doing. So once you have this giant scrum of females all gathered around, all competing for access to you, then you've got to make and sound good. So sound is critical. Females like males that sound good, and sound is central to all sorts of aspects of sage grouse breeding. So these are what we know are important from past research, including some of our own. But it's hard work to do this. Not every male can be a dick, right? It takes a lot of work to be sexy. We know that strutting is energetically costly. It takes lots and lots of energy. These guys get their energy from sage grouse. So this is not easy. And previous work suggested that there's possibly a quantity-quality trade-off going on. So you can either strut a lot, which females like, or you can sound really good, which females like, but doing both is really, really hard. Okay, so we know that this takes a lot of work and it's very difficult to do. And so we asked, how should a male spend his energy to maximize reproduction? So if you've got limited energy, how should you spend it tactically to maximize reproduction? Because of course, Matings are the currency of selection, right? This is what matters in terms of who passes on the genes to the next generation and how we end up shaping these kinds of behaviors. So what do we expect males to do to maximize reproduction? So we predicted that successful males would spend their effort when it matters the most, right? So you're going to invest when it matters the most by paying attention to females in a variety of different ways. So again, we need to look at controlling the female side of that conversation using robots. And so the first generation robot is right here. This is, uh, she rode around on G-scale train tracks. She had a little video camera and a microphone on board. She was fairly primitive. And um, she's a little bit chesty and a bit of a train wreck, so we called her Anna Nicole. <laughs> We retired her by crashing through a pyramid, which I have on video if anyone's interested in seeing that. But this is a little bit of the video that we collected with the onboard robot camera.
perspective of male 189, who never knew that it wasn't a real female. <laughs> but he learned to get a lot better at avoiding that. <laughs> and it's totally worth it for the video. Okay, so that was generation one robot. This is the beginning of the second generation of robots. So it arrived like this in the mail from my engineering friend. We designed it together. This is what they sent me. It looked like a sort of escaped rotisserie chicken, angry escaped rotisserie chicken. The next phase looks like an angry S&M escaped rotisserie chicken, which is a little hard to describe, but I brought that phase up here on the stage. Anyone's welcome to come up and check them out afterwards. And then I dressed them up to look like a real bird, using skins from the game and fish freezer that get turned in as road kills, etc. And this is the finished product. So uh, this is the next generation. She rides around on pretty burly badass tires there, and we call her Snooki. <laughs> so Snooki has much, she's got some skills. She can do some things besides just cruise around and look back and forth. She can also look, she can imitate behaviors that are important to female sage grouse. So the first behavior is just looking really not all that interested in mating, and then females forage when they're moving around the leck. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well, but she's basically just pecking at the ground, foraging, cruising around the leck. That's what females do when they're really not all that interested in mating any time in the near future. When they're more interested, they spend more time kind of upright, looking around, actually paying attention to what the males are doing. And so we can drive her around to where we need her to be on the back. <laughs> All right, so back to Dick. Let's just, to refresh ourselves on what we know is important in uh, mating, we know that sexy sage grouse show up and work hard, they're not scabby, they have lots of other hens around, and they sound good. So what else have we found using the fembot? What can we add to this list about social intelligence? So just to, again, summarize in very general terms what kinds of things we found, a few of our key results. First, we found that successful males, so again, males that mate a lot with real females, successful males save their energy by displaying at the highest rate only when hens are close. And this is when hens are really assessing male display rate. So this is when it matters the most in influencing the female's decision. And then by doing so, they show no trade-off between quantity and quality. So they save their energy, and they can put on a really good show when it's most likely to influence the female's behavior. Unsuccessful males, again, are just blasting away at a mediocre level all of the time. And then when the female actually does get up close, like when you send a robot in, they don't have anything left. Right? So they give us a really crappy show. So, if we were to then summarize this for some sort of take-home message that might function as dating advice for the sage browse, it would look something like this. Don't dance like no one is up. <laughs> Solid advice. Okay? So the next thing we found, this is a different study, still being analyzed, but we found that successful males save their energy by investing more courtship effort in females who show signs of being interested in copulating. So basically, these successful males, Dick and his friends, just don't waste, they don't spend much time on females that don't look actually interested in mating. And this is why it's dangerous to take dating advice from sage grouse, or to try to give dating advice from sage grouse. Because really, that's not advice I want to give right there. Um, but in case anyone is even thinking about taking that advice, um, I would remind you, you are not a sage grouse. <laughs> I would also remind you that evolution is not an excuse. <laughs> and don't be a dick. <laughs> okay, so just to wrap up then, I do, uh, you, you probably notice sage grouse in the news a lot lately. Hopefully, you've seen sage grouse in the news for a lot of different reasons. One of those reasons is that they're declining in numbers dramatically, and there's a listing decision, a decision about whether they're going to end up on the endangered species list in September or October of this year. Unless, of course, uh, House Republicans can stop it by adding riders onto spending bills where they're trying to just prevent the decision from actually being funded. And um, that probably won't stop it, but, uh, but they're trying. The most recent attempt is amazing. It's arguing that Congress must act to protect military readiness because protecting sage grouse could hurt the military. Um, so it may seem like in the midst of these conservation concerns and threats to our very national security caused by sage grouse that 
that studying courtship behavior is a little esoteric, and I know I don't need to defend basic science at nerd night, right? Because we're all on board with the importance of basic science, but I'm going to do it anyway, just for a minute. And that is to make a case for why it's important to do this basic science on sage grouse, despite all of this going on. So sage grouse have been an important model system in evolutionary biology for decades. People have been studying these guys. This is a cover from 1932, Nature magazine, with a sage grouse on it. So people have been studying these guys for a long time, and we've learned so much from them about the way the world works, about how sexual selection works, how lecking evolves. We've learned all sorts of things from sage grouse. And we talk about lots of different reasons why it would be terrible if species go extinct, including their important role in the ecosystem and all sorts of very important reasons. But one thing that we often forget to think about is just the intellectual loss of not being able to continue learning from these absolutely amazing species like we have been for so long. So in addition to that, there's also the importance of just understanding their behavior in these natural, pristine environments. So their natural reproductive behaviors. So that when those environments change, like this bird here, who is the last bird remaining on the left of the natural gas field on the other side of the Wind River Range Mountains where I work, um, where he's surrounded by natural gas drilling rigs. So we understand how these kinds of land use changes are going to affect the city trials. And these are not isolated land use changes. This is very hard to see, but that's what that gas field looks like from Google Earth. Each of these spots represents one of these giant uh, drilling rigs. So this is huge and widespread, and I've done a lot of work in my lab um, looking at the impact of this kind of development on sage grouse green behaviors, looking at noise pollution, impacts on sounds and other aspects of their reproduction that connects really strongly with the basic behavioral research that we've done. And it's not just natural gas and fossil fuels, it's also solar energy and wind energy, lots of green energy, as well as other kinds of land use changes that have been happening for generations already. So, as the need for conservation action becomes even more acute, there's more need than ever for both basic and applied science to understand and protect this remarkable bird. Not just for David, of course. And so with that, I just want to say thank you to all these funny sources, and if I have time, I'm happy to take any questions.